Hello, I'm Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Even before annual ASCO 2023 meeting, we had seen two key approvals already this year in GU malignancies, and fortumab with Pembro in bladder cancer, and then the combination of abiraterone with olaparib in prostate cancer. Today, we're here to discuss more practice-changing studies presented at the annual ASCO 2023 meeting. We'll start off with Telepro study, which has resulted in the approval of telozaparib with enzulutamide in prostate cancer, then switch gears to focus on RCC with CLEAR study and CONTACT03 study, and then lastly, we'll focus on THOR study in bladder cancer. To cover all these critical studies, we're joined by a friend, educator, clinician, a world-renowned researcher, Dr. Tony Shuari from Dana-Farber. Dr. Shuari, welcome. No, thank you for having me, Rahul and Rohit. It's a pleasure. We had a busy ASCO 23 meeting. Great meeting. It was a pleasure to see both of you. Thank you, Dr. Shuari, for joining us today. Dr. Shuari, let us get started with Telepro 2 study, which was presented by Dr. Neeraj Agarwal, that has now right hot off the press, led to the approval of telezoparib with enzalutamide in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Could you please walk us through the study design and dive in into the results post after that? Yeah, I, I, I love the slides animation. So uh, the Telapro uh, 2 study was a first-line metastatic uh, study for castration-resistant prostate cancer. It's a first-line study, typically patient with good performance status, that would get enzalutamide, we get that as standard of care with placebo or with uh, talazoparib, and uh, that's the PARP in inhibitor. There is data of PARP inhibitor activity in addition to ADT and hormonal therapy uh, preclinically, and safety with that combination. Interesting, you know, uh, the first cohort was an all-comer, then the result whether patient are non-deficient or deficient in HRR, uh, homozygous uh, repair um, genes, uh, alteration um, uh, was, you know, these were divided into yes versus no. And then a, a, another cohort of 200 plus patients that were HR, HRR uh, altered, the mutant, were added later. So it's interesting how the uh, study was um, you know, done, uh, all uh, done right. The primary endpoint was radiologic progression-free survival and your usual key secondary endpoint. But what Dr. Um, Agarwal presented and, you know, published concomitantly in the Lancet and two, three weeks later, FDA approved, is the data where he took part of cohort one, those 169 patients that have HRR mutation and cohort um, you know, another cohort also that had the mutation and presented these results. And that clearly show a, a progression-free survival benefit for combining talazoparib and enzalutamide over enzalutamide in, the H, in, in this population. Uh, overall survival uh, was trending. The hazard ratio was 0.69 with a p-value of 0.068. So in theory, um, this is not met. Uh, the median, I would say, uh, follow-up for uh, RPFS was short, was less than 20 months. Now, if you look at uh, BRCA versus non-BRCA, there's a lot of um, data there that really the BRCA patient are the one among HRR that will benefit. The hazard ratio actually uh, goes down both for radiologic PFS as well overall survival. So the hazard ratio of 0.69, let's say for OS, not significant, goes down to 0.61. Still not significant because the confidence interval gonna get you know wider and wider. But you know, I think you know this is the approval was in patient with uh, mutations. Uh, that we saw a couple of days. You are the first within a few hours or not a few minutes to tweet about it. So that's how I, I learned faster than ever, anyone. I think that's an important, uh, this has been like five, six years in the make, making. It's an important um, addition. Uh, I think there'll be always, always, always the discussion 
whether overall survival should be met, uh, you know, to to you know to change completely practice. Are the patients that will be treated in practice the one that are BRCA positive compared to the other, let's say ATM, et cetera. That debate is here to stay for the time being. Absolutely. I think you brought up some very key uh, points. Not all homologous recombinant repair mutations are the same. We saw the approval with abiraterone and olaparib in hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. That is only for BRCA positive, whereas here, we're seeing a little broader uh, approval, but again, we have to be careful in applying this in day-to-day -day, uh, with our patients, keeping that in mind that not all HRR repair mutations are the same. And I think we can all applaud to these results and uh, these approvals, but until unless we take the onus to make sure that we are checking on these mutations, our patients would not benefit. So the important thing is to check for these mutations, whether that's prostate cancer, uh, bladder cancer, and goes on to lung cancer and other types of cancer as well. Well, thank you for covering that, Dr. Shari. Now let's focus on RCC, a space that you personally have been very actively involved here to set the stage for what the current standard of care is. We have update from clear study looking at the pembrolizumab and lenvatinib combination data in first-line metastatic RCC. We have also seen this combination being active in non-clear cell um, renal cancer. Dr. Shuari, your thoughts on this update? Yeah, this is the last update from uh, clear. The result stands, you know, uh, CR, um, you know, progression-free survival stand and overall survival, when I mean closer to one. Let me go back to remind everyone about CLEAR. It's a frontline trial, the last uh, frontline trial, at least with sunetinib as control. And uh, uh, the experimental arm were two, uh, one that has a PD-1 inhibitor, lenvatinib, pembrolizumab, and the other one is Lymvatin and Beverolime is trying to bring a non-IO combination as first line. Don't want to dwell over it, but the combination of Lymvatin and Beverolime is despite achieving a response rate and a PFS benefit over sunitinib, did not have an overall survival benefit, had an overall survival hazard ratio over one. So this is not just approved, not used in um, a practice. So focus is on lenvatinib pembrolizumab arm. A uh, large study, the progression-free survival was the prime uh, primary endpoint with usual usual culprit, a secondary endpoint. So if you look at the whole population, there is a certainly a benefit. It seems that benefit extend to favorable risk in terms of response rate, PFS, not overall survival. And so that's a pattern we've seen with other VEGF IO uh, combinations. Uh, you know, in this setting, and partly is due to the rarity of event and the small uh, population of uh, uh, patients. Now, we know this paradigm where first-line immunotherapy and TKI has been utilized. So when utilizing lenvatinib, what, how do you dose adjust these patients or how do you initiate the therapy? You know, there are multiple dose adjustments with lenvatinib. In practice, a lot of patients, the majority, I would say, the vast majority, do not tolerate uh, the 20 milligram, uh, you know, uh, combination. They go down to 18, 14. I have patients even on 10. Uh, it's a trial and error, which is the same with all TKIs. Do I start everyone on 20? I would say not always. Uh, there is no uh, guidelines, but I think people that uh, I would say may not have, uh, I don't think they will tolerate 20. I may start lower. It's very, very subjective, especially uncontrolled hypertension, prior heart disease. Uh, so there are several schools of thought. I don't have the same problem with cabozentinib, which usually I start because the dose is not the 60, it's the 40 with nivolumab. Thanks for going on with that. Now, leading on to our second line option, this was an important study that was in fact presented by you, um, second line setting RCC. After progression, upfront IO and TKI is certainly an therapy that we tend to utilize. However, second line is a big unmet need. We often battle with this question, would reintroducing IO post prior use 
Is there truly a benefit? And that's exactly what this study was intended to answer. So this was contact 03, Dr. Shori, the study so design this, this, and its findings. This came from observation in renal and other tumor of uh, several second opinion, including, you know, from our place that people uh, keeping the IO or switching uh, here, I'm going to say the PD-1, PD-L1. You know, I've seen a lot of second opinion, what to do after nevo AP followed by Pembroaxi, what will be, and I'm like, why the Pembroaxi, not Axi or Cabo Nevo? So when we looked at uh, the literature outside renal cell, we didn't find randomized phase three trial. Um, bladder and lung and melanoma, phase three we're talking. So uh, luckily uh, around the time we're, that we we're thinking the combination of atezolizumab and cabozentinib was being explored, but not in the pre-IO setting, in first line prior TKI only, and found to be uh, tolerable and active. So we asked ourselves, since a lot of the patient frontline gonna get a PD-1 inhibitor, nevocabo, pembrolan, pembroaxi, and since atezolizumab as a single agent has activity in untreated metastatic RC. There was a trial that, uh, you know, randomized phase two of atezobev, atezo versus sunitinib that had 50 patients on atezolizumab, an uh, untreated patient. That trial name was Emotion 150. And it showed a 25% response rate. So atezo single agent is active. So we said, you know, let's test this. You know, with atezolizumab, it would be great to keep the PD-1, PD-L1 axis, and um, the study enrolled over 520 patients. We, we allowed non-clear cell, especially papillary, which does have activity to IO and to CABO. Uh, interesting enough, the result came that there is not single hit of benefit, not even one. PFS, response rate, OS, the curves, the response rate, the same. And when you look at PFS and response rate by independent center review or investigator assessment, not a single hit. You look at the forest plots, see all those patients that maybe have non-clear cell, those patients that didn't have TKI, one third of patients probably came from nevo AP directly to Cabo or Cabo Atizo, not a single hit of benefit. And we saw the toxicity, not surprisingly, when you have Cabo Atezo versus Cabo, you're going to see some more toxicity. We saw more toxicities, nothing unusual, but, but more toxicities overall numerically with the uh, combination than single agent cabozentinib. So I don't think this, um, the question of PD-1, post PD-1 or PD-L1 is answered. We have a study that actually uh, finishing accrual. It's called t 2, where think about contact three the same, but you replace cabozentinib by tivazinib. There, there is a small changes. And you use nivolumab, a PD-1 inhibitor. That study is many of us around the globe are involved in. It finished accrual. It will answer the question of salvage PD-1. Uh, and hopefully we can close that chapter in renal cell. And it's important why we do randomized phase three. I can tell you, when we surveyed the oncology community, I'm not talking about GU and kidney cancer, doc, melanoma, lung, et cetera. We saw almost, we saw no responses. Like folks always knew what the answer is. There weren't many folks that said, I don't know. There were folks that said, it's almost unethical. You have to give it, of course. And folks that said, it will not work. So I think the randomized trial here are very important. This is a negative, completely negative study. We published this with Dr. Powell in The Lancet. Uh, and I think it's it's important sometimes to translate what we don't know into a randomized trial. And again, we've seen this a little more in the last few years. It is so good to have these negative studies being discussed because they are practice informing. And not only in RCC, we see this trend in and so many other disease sites we might re-challenge without having the data. So again, congratulations to do this study, though this was a negative study. Well, Dr. Shari, thank you for covering that. Now switching gears to focus on bladder cancer. As at the opening, we had briefly mentioned, we've seen enfortumab and Pembro being approved in cis ineligible patients with metastatic bladder cancer. But after progression on first-line treatment, it is important to consider patients to 
have any actionable mutations so that we can consider or defitinib as a possible option. During this annual conference, we saw the data from a Thor study. Dr. Shuari, what was the inclusion criteria in the study findings here? Your patient with metastatic urothelial uh, cancer here needed to have their tumor progressing on prior PD-1, PD-L1, up to two line of systemic therapy. But those patients that have the FGFR23 uh, alteration, which is around 15%, 10 to 15 mutation fusion, were the one, you know, that uh, were the subject of this randomization to an FGFR inhibitor, or the fitinib, um, already approved based on, uh, you know, prior uh, trial versus chemotherapy. Maybe chemotherapy also would work better in uh, a mutated FGFR mutated disease. The result came in, the primary endpoint here was overall survival, um, and the result came in, I would say not surprising, a bit underwhelming, a bit, a bit, but certainly something to uh, remember. Median overall survival 20, 12 versus close to eight months. This is an OS that is statistically significant you know, four months is clinically relevant. The PFS 5.6 versus 2.7 months also. It tells you more than anything else, the unmet medical need that we still have in bladder cancer. We have a new drug here. This could be second, third line or more. And the median OS 12 months. Yes, this is better than having, you know, chemotherapy uh, here, but uh, we still need to do better. Uh, but I like to see targeted treatment and precision medicine in a randomized fashion. So I congratulate Dr. Lorio and the authors um, of the TOR study. I think this was very convincing. Again, additional therapy option for our patients and now seeing the overall survival data just to affirm that. Again, I can't just bring uh, this importance of NGS testing, Dr. Shwari, uh, as we have to have to check for FGFR mutation in this case, but just again to reiterate how important this is. No, Dr. Shwari, thank you so much for taking the time to discuss these practice changing studies from ASCO 2023 with us today. These highlights will give our community oncologists a chance to stay up to date in rapidly evolving field. For our listeners, please wait for a quick recap. We just wrapped up our interview with Dr. Tony Shwari to cover some of the important studies from GU space at ASCO 2023. First, we covered Telepro 2, which has led to the approval of telozoparib in prostate cancer. This approval signifies the importance of testing for homologous recombinant repair mutations for our uh, prostate cancer patients. We are used to treating our patients with enzalutamide or PARP inhibitors independently, but now the combination approach shows promising results and should be considered in the right patient. After covering prostate cancer, we covered two important studies from RCC space. One was updated results from clear study with use of lenvatinib with pembrolizumab, which again reiterates the current standard of care option in RCC patients with TKI and immunotherapy combination in the first line setting. We also saw that this combination is in fact active in non-clear cell renal cell cancer. However, re-challenging this patient population in second line setting with immunotherapy, particularly atezolizumab, was not fruitful as shown by a negative contact 03 study. And then lastly, we covered Thor studies showing overall survival benefit with erdafitinib in FGFR mutated metastatic bladder cancer patients. Erdafitinib was previously approved based on phase two study, but now we have overall survival benefit. As a treating physician, we need to appreciate some unique side effects, including ocular toxicity when it comes to erdafitinib. Thank you for tuning in. Join back for more practice-changing discussions for community medical oncologists with us, the Oncology Brothers.